Dr. Methi has been working as a consultant in infectious disease at Fourth Valley Royal Hospital since October 2017. Since that time, he has been part of the small team setting up a brand new infectious disease and OPAT surface service. He has previously worked as a junior doctor in several ID departments in the UK, including Aberdeen, Fries, Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, and in London. As well as an interest in service development, he also has an interest in medical education and has previously worked for the University of Aberdeen for two years as a clinical teaching fellow. So our next uh, rock star, our next presenter is Dr. Manjul Madhi. He's going to talk about the, you know, what is going on in the front line when we are pre uh, treating COVID patients. And I think the context would be with ivermectin as well. So we have seen Dr. Madhi's uh, bio before as well. He has been working as a consultant in infectious diseases at Fourth Valley Royal Hospital since October 2017. So Dr. Mehdi, welcome and please take it away. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to such a, a large and diverse audience from the frontline perspective of a infectious diseases consultant working in the, in the UK NHS and I, I work in Scotland, so it's the Scottish NHS. So this will be very much from the perspective from the UK and the NHS, but hopefully it'll be applicable to everybody globally. And um, after all the great talks we've had today, which has just been fantastic, this one will be hopefully um, not, not as clever, not as intellectual, but hopefully just an opportunity to, to talk about how to come together and how to take some actions going forward. And really, I want to start with where I want to end, and that's just to thank the, the bravery and the sincerity and the humanity of, of the organizers and everyone who's attending today, and, and let today be the start of an ongoing movement that, that leads to improvement in patient lives as, as soon as possible. My background is I work in a district general hospital in central Scotland. And uh, I, I work on a 32 bedded ward, which for a lot of the last 12 months has been filled or almost full of COVID patients. And I routinely follow up all discharges with a six week telephone call monitoring on long COVID. But I won't talk about that um, just now because we've had that covered very extensively, but I will be hoping to do original research um, looking into treatments for long COVID in the near future. Um, this, I think, will be typical for the majority of, of people around the world. And this is the very typical presentation of the patients that I see in the UK. Uh, we don't routinely do a CT chest, but we do if there is a um, concern of a PE or other complications. I think in some parts of the world, CTs are done much more commonly. And we very much follow the, the treatment protocol as, as really directed by the recovery trial predominantly, which obviously is a UK based trial. And um, so the, the NHS um, has taken a lot of its lead on treatments. Um, and so the standard of care currently for severe COVID, which is the majority of patients I see in hospital with hypoxia is oxygen DVT prophylaxis low dose dexamethasone for up to 10 days and to consider tocilizumab if the CRP is greater than 75 and ongoing recruitment into the recovery trial, which is, has just stopped recruiting on aspirin. So we should get a result for that soon. And it's currently got um, biracitinib, which is a JAX1 and 2 inhibitor, the Regeneron antibody cocktail and a, a new uh, drug used for multiple sclerosis, sclerosis that's just recently been added. And then we'd refer to HG1 ITU if patients deteriorate despite 19 liters of oxygen on the ward. Um, I've been part of an infection community in my hospital and a Scotland wide community. And we noticed these case reports of disseminated strongyloides in patients treated with um, steroids, high dose steroids, and tocilizumab. And so we, we felt as, as our expert opinion that we should um, try and screen for that. Where I work in central Scotland, actually in our first wave, it was a 97% Caucasian population. So not somewhere you'd think was a hotspot of strongyloides. 
but we decided to have our own interpretation of this um, guidelines that was um, created by the London Hospital for Tropical Medicine in, in London. It, it goes into two slides, um, which I'll let you look at the details um, uh, later, but essentially we risk assess people clinically for their risk factors for having previous stronger lordies infection. And if they are high risk, which would be someone who is born and brought up in the tropics and has spent time in rural areas, barefoot, and, and various other risk factors, then we would consider giving empirical ivermectin prior to their dexamethasone, tocilizumab, and pendant test results. And this is to prevent the possibility of sudden death with disseminated strongyloides or strongyloides hyperinfection syndrome, which can lead to gram negative sepsis and death, which would be indistinguishable, especially in our um, low prevalence population of tropical diseases, it'll be indistinguishable between someone who had a hospital acquired gram negative sepsis and sudden death. So by using this protocol in our expert opinion, um, we have treated a small number of patients with COVID with ivermectin uh, specifically to reduce their risk of stronger lordies infection. We, we, and this is really my question is that I've done this as an infectious disease physician with the support of my colleagues in the, the Scottish ID community. And this has not been a problem. So ivermectin does exist in the, in the UK and you can prescribe it off license. And we, and we do prescribe it. I've worked as an infection doctor since 2005 in the NHS and I've prescribed it regularly and it's, it's never been questioned um, any of my prescriptions for parasitic infections or scabies. And you know, I wonder what, what do we call this? Do we call this evidence-based medicine? There's no randomized controlled control trial data to, to support what we're doing, but I think it is evidence-based. It's, it's certainly an expert opinion. It certainly involves risk-benefit analysis and, and individual case-by-case -case, um, discussion and consent, and really respecting the autonomy of the specialists to treat a patient at risk of sudden death, but also the autonomy of the patient to have ex access to safe treatments that may have a real positive impacts on their mortality. So really, I, I just want to use this as a stepping stone to why on earth are we not using ivermectin to treat all stages of COVID in the, in the UK and the NHS currently, where, as we've seen today, the evidence base is far superior than actually for any other reasons that we use ivermectin for. And even though it's not licensed in its oral form in the UK, it's been recommended by the WHO and it's on numerous guidelines and it has been used for decades safely and to improve patients' health, so much so that the inventor won the Nobel Prize in 2015. So I really just wanna talk about this in a slightly less um, scientific manner, but just really on an ethical, kind of risk benefits, kind of clinical. I, I, I think of myself as a clinician predominantly who every day makes risk benefit analysis on prescribing drugs where the evidence base is often um, not complete, but where there's a real potential of, of improving a patient's health and, and, and obviously a potential for harm from side effects and also the harm of not prescribing antimicrobials at the right time, particularly someone at risk of severe bacterial sepsis. And I think we need to respect the autonomy of the patient to be offered treatments that an, an expert clinician feels is of benefit, the autonomy of a, a consultant to offer treatments that they think is of benefits. And I think we should quote the Hippocratic Oath and the Health Sinting Declaration as, as <clears throat> justifications for this. And I also think that if, if we presented this data to non-health professionals, patients, patients' relatives, the lay public, and I personally think this data is, is so compelling, it's very easy for anybody to understand with a little bit of teaching that most people will be thinking, why on earth are we not prescribing this? Why aren't we giving this? And rather than doctors worrying about um, prescribing and off license medication, I, I worry about patients um, complaining, why have I not given them a safe drug which has such good data for such a marked benefits on mortality and symptoms? and ineffectivity. So just to summarize the risk benefit analysis, uh, I think it's between 16 and 18 associated deaths in 3.7 billion doses for us from Dr. Tess Laurie's talk earlier. 
and, and this drug has been used for four decades. And, and, and some of these deaths would have actually been association only, and some of them would have been avoidable if um, we eliminate people who've, had, who've got concurrent lower low infection or other contraindications to ivermectin. And the benefits I've briefly summarized with the data, we don't know the exact benefits for an individual, but we know on a ballpark figure that there is a 60 to 90% drop in mortality when looking at treating all stages of COVID. And as a clinician, as a quantitative researcher and a qualitative researcher, I believe in the concept of triangulation of data and not looking at um, a problem from one perspective on its own. I think this conference has been fantastic and shown us the data from um, real world mass epidemiological data, controlled observational trial data, which maybe we've, we've not talked about so much today, R high quality analysis of multiple randomized controlled trials and plausible mechanism of action data. I think also listening to physicians and patient stories, I think should, should never be ignored. So for me personally, it's a, it's a no brainer, that the risk benefit analysis, and even though there's uncertainty of the magnitude of magnitude of effect or the best dose, I noticed there's been lots of questions about the right dose. I think the honest answer is we don't know what the best dose is, but all doses that have been described today are safe and they all seem to work. And on average, the higher doses seem to, to work better. Trying to understand why it's been so difficult for this message to be understood is, is difficult, um, but personally, I think it's impossible to think about the current situation without looking through the lens of structural bias, subconscious bias of, 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 of the healthcare profession and, and people in power in the healthcare profession, and the inequity about people who suffer from COVID, which are actually often the people most disenfranchised in society. So in terms of actions that we can take from today, and I'm, I'm very keen that we, we start actions now, today, tomorrow, and, and, and I'll be taking the confidence from the data from this conference to continue my discussions about the risk benefit analysis of treating inpatients and um, in hospitals, but also in primary care of ivermectin and giving patients the opportunity to discuss whether they are, they are willing to consider an off-license medication, but also with my clinical colleagues and my local governance team and drug and therapeutics committee. And if I and the patients um, think the benefits outweigh the risks, we should um, we should start prescribing. And I think we should use the support of myself, a network of UK prescribers who believe in prescribing ivermectin today, and quotes um, globally, the, the, the many prescribers I've met in globally and quote this conference, the BIRD website, the FLCC website, many sovereign nations and, um, and, and regions that have guidelines, that the Hippocratic Oath. And I please encourage people to email me directly as soon as possible if you want to join this movement. I, I believe that um, the fear is the only real barrier and that doctors should not fear doing the right thing based on their clinical judgments, the right thing for their patients. I think that our barriers are actually paper walls. And I think if we have the bravery to walk through them, they will, they will fall apart. And I think we are also so much stronger when we work together in unison in numbers. And I think it's, it's been, we've made real progress. And I think we need, also need, need to engage with the legal profession, like the South African doctors who've won their legal case to, to prescribe ivermectin routinely. Several US hospitals have had to prescribe ivermectin when patients and relatives have asked for that. And there's been official rollouts on many countries, including Peru, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Uttar Pradesh and India, which, and we've heard a lot about this data already. So I, again, want to thank um, everybody involved in this conference, the FLCC, the BIRD, and the bravery that they have shown, and specifically Dr. Tessa Laurie of the Bird, Pierre Corey of FLCC, and Dr. Bean. And I'd like to follow their lead. I'd like other people to follow my lead as a frontline clinician and really to spread this message to all independent healthcare professionals who value their professionalism and their patients' health. Um, I won't try and 
play this YouTube video just now in case it goes wrong, but it's a crazy dancing video about showing the importance of following a leader and how quickly a movement can follow that may seem crazy to, to people when it's in a minority. So you can have a look at that video later. And um, for some reason, this um, ancient um, story, which comes from Eastern religious texts, which was also written by a 19th century um, writer, uh, Mr. Saxon, makes me come to mind where this is the story of six blind men who are looking at an elephant from different perspectives. And by looking through their narrow senses, they mistaken what they're seeing. But to me, ivermectin, the data is so clear. We've looked at it from so many different angles. And actually, I'm sure blind men with their sense, extra sense of touch and awareness would instantly recognize that ivermectin is a drug that is safe and that it works. And it's really inexplicable how the people in authority have not been able to see this, but I'm very confident that we'll change this very soon with this movement. Thank you very much for, you, for listening to me and please, any questions now or, or after the conference, please contact me directly. Thank you. Dr. Medhi, thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation. Fear is the main driver. The paper, the, the wall, the barrier is a paper wall. Let's get together and work on it. I love it. Even that video, I am sure this is a video where people are on a, on a hill, I believe, and there is a, some event going on and a couple of them start dancing and then the whole group starts dancing. So thank you very much for this. Uh, if you are okay.